my name is Quinn. When I got to high school, I had to present myself as myself, and I didn't know who that was. I was always trying to be someone that I thought other people would like, but I ended up feeling really lonely and like isolated. I felt pressure to look a certain way and act a certain way, have a boyfriend or something. So I tried that, you know, what? had a boyfriend. Come on. and then cut all my hair off. I kind of knew that would make me feel more like myself. I wasn't really consciously aware of like where I was going. I like, knew I was like attracted to girls. My gender identity wasn't really a question. I didn't know that that was something you could even question. I thought, you know, I, w I was what I was and that wasn't anything that I could change. In your head, you like have this image of yourself, and then I look in the mirror and I see like a complete stranger. I remember waking up in the middle of the night one night and saying like I need to transition, and it didn't come as a surprise to a lot of like my friends and stuff. I think it shocked my family a bit. Um, I didn't directly tell my mom. Um, I, I wasn't ready to tell her when she found out. I, I changed my gender on Facebook to male. My grandma saw that, called my mom. And of course, most people don't look at those things on Facebook and think anything of it, but grandmas do. So, <laughs> she, uh, yeah, she, she talked to my mom and then my mom kind of, it took her off guard, I guess. She kind of freaked out a bit. My mom feels like she's losing her daughter. Oh boy. Come on. Would you rather have a suicidal daughter or a happy son? I've been struggling with depression since I was like 12, and it's something that is still like a daily battle. There was a lot of factors that influenced my depression, but definitely being uncomfortable in myself was one of the bigger ones. Feeling like an alien in my own body. Some people were saying that you had to get your mental shit figured out before you could start transitioning. And I feel like I can't, I can't move forward until I transition. I got put on a waiting list to see a doctor in Edmonton who could refer me to another doctor who could start me on hormones. But that was a long wait. So in the meantime, I found a surgeon in Ontario about getting top surgery. My breasts, I hated them. They were weird and I always felt kind of like ashamed of them. To get surgery here in the province, I would have had to wait at least another like two years. And that was just something I wasn't prepared to do. It was like, it was a big cause of dysphoria for me, like. The wait time is really tough for some people. Some people don't make it, don't make it the two years that you have to wait. I have three trans guy friends. Two of them have tried to commit suicide. And if you, if you include me, that's three out of four. I get an injection of testosterone every week. I've noticed when I'm like singing along to a song in the car, there's higher notes that I could have confidently reached before that like I can't at all now. I can speak a little bit lower, sing a bit lower. Whistlers, please. I'm turning into a different person. I like that. I have more energy. I want to lift heavy things and 
run and stuff. The reason that I want to work out and get stronger is, is for safety. I'm a more vulnerable person. I worry about strangers. My first thing on my mind is like, is this person safe to be around? Like, are they gonna look at me and be like, what the fuck is that? How about... A family friend, Eva, made this experimental film with me. My life was so different back then. I went to school in the neighborhood. Both of my older brothers still lived at home. My parents were still together, all under one roof, you know. I remember that day and I remember saying, fly, fly, fly. <laughs> I had such like big long hair and people commented all the time, you know, it was like a big part of me. Cutting it off was sort of like shedding that part of my identity. It was kind of nice like remembering that, that I was that kid. I still am that kid. I was a really shy kid. Hated wearing dresses. I like drawing pictures. I'm sick of talking about gender with people. I just want to live my life. There's your biological sex, which is like the physical things, and then there's your gender, which is how you feel inside, right? So I guess you are the gender you say you are how you present yourself to the world, how you feel for yourself. I'm not sure like what path I want to take going forward. You know, like I've been taking hormones and thinking of like taking a break from that. When I was more feminine, right, and like read that way, I didn't like that. And I'm not sure that being read as 100% masculine will accurately portray me either. Like, I don't know if going from one end of the spectrum to the other is what's right for me. Maybe I just need to slide over to the middle a little bit more. There's a lot of pressure to like follow it through to the end. But like right now, I know that it's best for me not to. I just want to be happy. <laughs> I just want to feel free. And honestly, I felt very free since I sort of decided that I'm just gonna like take a break and like just focus on myself without more changes. What I've noticed is just uh, the joy that's come back into Quinn's life and a freedom of spirit and a freedom of possibility. It's like Quinn's been unshackled. When I revisit history, I see things in a different way now. Do you have breakfast today? Uh, not yet. Do you want to your phone? I remember uh, forcing Quinn to wear a dress to do a piano recital, and uh, it was painful for Quinn. I felt, uh, after the fact, a lot of guilt because it was like a deer in the headlights. I didn't understand because I didn't see it coming. In hindsight, Quinn was pretty withdrawn. I recall the day where I got a call from Quinn's friend saying, you know, Quinn was suicidal and at the hospital. And that's when things started. So we had a period of time for about two or three months where Quinn was in the hospital, was severely depressed, was getting treatment, and none of this was really coming out. Um, but there were other signs. And so for me, it was a time of fear and confusion. What I had to do is rid myself of stereotypes I had attached to my child rather than seeing my child. I can't imagine how courageous Quinn's had to be. You can't make physical changes privately. Do you want this egg? Sure. The yolks. 
changes Quinn's mind again in the future fine <laughs> you know I doubt that that's gonna happen but people people worry about things like that but nothing's permanent we move out of the lines all of the time that child that you loved so unconditionally and held so close to your heart is the same child nothing changes love your child the country, off on an adventure. I met someone who lives over yonder, teaching in Abu Dhabi. Where's the guy? I met Skylar at, Hi. just like at a bar by chance, and had like a couple weeks Hi. to spend together. And I'm gonna go stay with her and travel a bit, see where life takes me. It's definitely fair to say that Quinn a year ago probably wouldn't have done this. But that's just part of growing. Constant change. You want to get in the suitcase? You want to come with me? <laughs> you want to come with me, buddy? You want to come on an adventure? Yes, guys. Yes, he does. I'm just like miles more secure and confident and comfortable in many aspects of my life and just ready. <laughs> yep. That'll do. I am still the same person. I still have the same obstacles to overcome. But I guess, yeah, just my attitude and my approach has shifted slightly. And just like my way of viewing said obstacles and the world around me has maybe shifted for the positive. You're gonna send me lots of pictures of yourself, okay? We can Skype. Last time I saw you, I was packing to go to Abu Dhabi because I fell in love with someone who was living there. Initially, I was just going to spend Christmas over there. I think I stayed there for seven months. We decided to move to Vancouver, and then Skylar got a job, and then I decided to apply for art at SFU. I enjoy making art, but I don't necessarily like, identify with that sort of title of artist. That's something that you, you call yourself. But then I also kind of feel like anyone's an artist, everyone's an artist. I don't want to be labeled as anything, including that, I guess. When I was young, I just enjoyed drawing. And I, I still do. If I was bored or something, my mom would just be like, here's a pen and a piece of paper from my purse. Like, entertain yourself. So that turned into a doodling habit. I see art as a very sort of tactile 
process. So I like to use my hands, use like draw things, make things, but like it is a very hands-on approach. I really enjoy the process of like being in a space with things and like feeling like textures. I struggle in class being told to start with a concept and then turn that into something physical. My brain doesn't work that way, it works the other way. Live in like the physical material world and then turn that into something conceptual. Having a connection with someone and just feeling so confident in them and comfortable with them, like it's, you can't explain it. It's just, it's just like a chemical thing, I don't know. We felt like we had to explore it and see where it went and now we're married. So it was a good decision. Quinn, you know, as a child, liked to spend time creating things. Creating things out of paper, playing the piano, moving and dancing and picking up leaves and <laughs> being outdoors and, and walking around and noticing all the little tiny things that are out there in the world. I would say that that was Quinn's relationship with, with play in the world and things like that. I think that we should stay out of their way of them becoming who they are. And maybe, you know, being a little more conscious about the gender stereotyping we do with our children. And I did it too. Photograph is supposed to capture the child, right? But we dress the child up in a princess outfit. But this says nothing about who Quinn is. It says everything about the box that we put that child in. And I think that that's interesting in hindsight. Quinn came home one day and said, uh, I've bought a one-way ticket to Abu Dhabi. And I thought, what? <laughs> Who wants their uh, recently out queer child going to Abu Dhabi uh, one way? I had concerns about Quinn, um, but there was no stopping them. Quinn was absolutely positive that Skylar was the one. I loved Skylar within 30 seconds of meeting them. I understood Quinn's choice. Seeing them together is fantastic. I think, you know, it's like the little strands I added like last minute, mm -hmm. kind of making a bloop. Yeah, fun. that's so done. Mm -hmm. As you may remember, I used select school notes, syllabuses, worksheets, things like that from past classes to kind of like demonstrate sort of the different aspects of getting an undergrad degree, trying to figure out your path. Why did you choose that one there? Because it says inference rules for identity. <laughs> and I, I just like the identity aspect. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of them kind of like touch on identity in one way or another, which is what it's all about, right? They wanted people to come up and read things. Like you'd like see like abortion really stands out there, like social behavior. I tried to make it so I had like things that were giving me anxiety, like coming right out of my head. So like little screenshots of late, because when you hand things in on Canvas, it if it's effort. late, then you get like a little notification that says like submitted, but late. So I have that. And then why the cyclical pattern? Everything's sort of cyclical, right? Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, when you're like spiraling through thoughts in your mind, right? What's next? Ah, um, looks so good. If we have to identify ourselves, we would both call ourselves queer, which is sort of a, oh, we view that as sort of a non-specific queer identity. I always felt like uncomfortable in my body. I felt like I was putting on a performance. I knew that the girl thing didn't feel right, and then I was transitioning, and I felt like something was not right, but I didn't know what it was, so I just kind of 
followed my instincts a bit, even though I didn't know where they were leading me, but I just kind of just waited. Just like, let me just pause and see how things unfold. The best way to describe my gender identity right now would be non-binary. People who identify as non-binary express themselves in many different ways, have many different bodies. I see it as sort of like open-ended. You don't owe any particular expression or look. Like you don't owe anyone anything. I, I think through things in a very tactile way. I like to fidget with things and when I'm trying to plan out what I'm gonna do. I sketch just as much as I would actually like take wire and stuff and I'd like play with it in space and sort of figure out how I want something to go. But it's it, like, it, it's the process that I enjoy. I, I get a lot of satisfaction from making art and like it's one of the only things that I can like sustain my attention on. This sort of way that people's attention is, is focused can allow people to see more and observe more and be more creative. Solve problems in different ways. A blank canvas, a blank piece of paper is both inviting and scary. There's a lot of potential it can become anything, but to actually decide what you will make, what will become of this empty space, that's a lot of, that's a lot of pressure. I'm really good at starting things on blank canvases and then, and then stopping. You never really finish anything, you just stop working on it. Yeah, this one's been taunting me because I started it when I had more time off and then I got really busy with the semester and so it's just been sitting there like, you didn't finish. I mean, how do you know when it's done? Like there's so many more details and things you can add. And I see a lot of things that could be changed, improved. I would say that I have finished works as in I'm finished with them. Um, but of course, I think everything could be revisited. We like just fell in love instantly. And I don't think I believed in love at first sight before then, but it happened very, very quickly. Would you like to sing? Yes. Who's calling? My mom is calling. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Quinn. Hi, mom. How's it going? Quinn is like super open-minded and intellectual, brave but beyond limits. Very like explorative and ideas and like push boundaries. And I, and I love that. Oh, I like that. I like the symmetry of that. Yeah, the filming is going well. You know me, like kind of uncomfortable being on camera, right? It doesn't come naturally, but <laughs> I trust Eva. I, I trust the process. Yeah, I'll call you later. Love you. Love you. Bye. <laughs> you have something important to share. Mm -hmm. It's not really about me. I'm like, I feel like it's an important topic. There's not a lot of representation for people who identify and take up space that you're taking up, right? It's important to create like a space for like our kid to grow up in where they can be who they want to be, like regardless of gender identity, and you're paving that path for them, right? Exactly. So we're having a baby. A baby. Yeah. <laughs> we're doing June. Part of being a queer couple is that you, you know that you will need like medical assistance. So that was something we were already like aware of would have to be part of our journey. Right, yeah. We knew that we would have to seek some sort of external way of getting pregnant. We are constantly asked if we know the sex of the child, and we intentionally have chosen not to learn the sex of the baby. We're not planning on telling anyone the sex also after the baby is born, sort of to try to force people not using gender stereotypes on our kids. 
the baby will just call us by our names. Yeah. Our kid might be the only kid in the school whose parents aren't mom and dad, or even mom and mom, and dad and dad. You know, we might be the only ones that are like. But we want to set them up for success by like teaching them to like advocate for themselves and our mm -hmm. family and like mm -hmm. be prepared for those scenarios. We want them to be prepared to exist within a system that like our family might not be the norm. People think that we are trying to raise our kid to be trans or to be non-binary or to be queer and that's not what we're trying to do. Although if they were any of those things, that would be more than fine. Mm -hmm. But like we are trying to open up the world for them and give them any possibility and as parents to just be there along the way, supporting them no matter what identity they choose. Friends have given us old baby clothes of theirs and specifically tried to make it neutral, which is like thoughtful on their part. Like they're definitely trying to do what they think we want, but that means that they've left out anything that's like stereotypically boyish or girlish, like the pink frilly things. And like, we want all of those things too. Like we might have to buy our kid the pink ruffly things because nobody else will. Part of the choice to move forward with gender creative parenting was in regards to like advocating for Quinn and Quinn's identity and Quinn's had a lot of struggles and hardships and continues to because of their identity and we don't want that for our kid. But I think another factor is there are so many issues in this world created by gender stereotypes that started in childhood. As a kid, people exclusively commented on my hair, like having like long curly blonde hair. It was the first thing and sometimes only thing people would say to me, strangers would be like, wow, look at your hair. And so now as a 26 year old, I like still feel like my hair is like my greatest asset, which is ridiculous. It try to intentionally keep it short sometimes. So I'm not like, obsessive but over it. To build off of that, I think not just your hair, but like your looks in general were always commented on. And probably that plays a big role in like you trying to understand how to express your gender. I feel like I grew up being told things like that and I thought that was the only thing that was worthy about me. Is like, that's all that anyone ever says to me is like, oh, you're cute, look at your hair, you're pretty, something like that. So like, that's all there is to me. That's the only thing that people like about me. So like, what if I'm not pretty anymore? Then I'm yeah. nothing, which is, doesn't, people shouldn't feel that way. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the hardest things to find out is just like, what do I want? Like that. Totally. Why do I exist? <laughs> yeah, why <laughs> am I even alive? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I can't wait to meet the little baby. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Very us too. Excited. Us too, yeah. I hope I can be a meaningful person in, in, in the little one's life. and yeah. Totally. Mm -hmm. Another Edmonton auntie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ooh. People use the boxes and labels to make things easier. You need to group things to understand the world, but that also comes with a lot of restrictions. And people aren't just like a set of labels. In five years, I don't know where I'm gonna be. And I don't wanna know. I'm okay not knowing. I feel like that's the beauty of life, is not, you don't know what's gonna happen next. Fly, Sunny, fly. Should I be a man or a woman? What does that?
Become an account.